Welcome to the final episode of Demol Belgi Season 7 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who is considered by most people in his life to be the sneaky bastard, Logan Saunders. Evening. Good evening. And I shall start, as I have been doing in the past ten weeks, where in the world is Logan Saunders? You're not going to believe this answer, I don't think. I'm actually podcasting from Egypt today. He is. He's in Cairo. Yeah, you can probably hear the honking and stuff, because I'm right outside one of the many busy and chaotic roads within Cairo. You wouldn't want to drive here. Bit of a change from Antwerp for you, then. Yeah, Antwerp, it's more bicycles. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of weird for us, because our recording schedule last week was messed up, obviously, by us being in at the finale. Did we mention that a few times? So... We're recording this on Wednesday. It's ten days since we've actually recorded a Belgian Mole podcast, even though, in reality, there's actually not been any change in terms of the release schedule. Yeah. So it's a bit odd for us, really. (laughs) And it's also sad. I don't want to end this season. Considering everything else that's on reality TV right now, and with the news of how terrible Amazing Race Canada is going to be, I'm very sad for this to be over, too. Shall we just break down the fact that we're also co- currently covering Amazing Race 31, which I'm less high on than I think I should be. We have Survivor that ends tonight, which could be a terrible season depending on who the winner is. We have Survivor South Africa starting tomorrow, which I'm quietly optimistic for, but 21 people is a lot of people, and it's also 18 weeks. 18 Oh, so there's going to be no double boots then. No, it's a, they've already confirmed it's 18 episodes because they've confirmed when the finale date is because it's the week before I'm in South Africa. Oh. I think it's the 12th of September that the finale airs, and I'm in South Africa from the week after. Holy hell, that's a long TV schedule. I guess the last season was such a big success then. Yeah. Um, and Amazing Race Canada, which we're not touching with a barge pole, which is going to be terrible. Yeah, I mean, I tried to watch last season, and I only lasted one episode. This season, they're actually taking like 50 steps backwards by the sounds of it, which I didn't think was possible. But anyway, we're here to talk about a good show, and our favourite show of the year. Not just because we were at the finale last week, did we mention that, but also the fact that it is genuinely the greatest show on TV. And for Venom producers, take notes on how to do a proper reunion or um, sabotage summer or season summary. This is how you do a proper season summary and reunion special. Well, Venom used to do their finales like this, and then they did the whole Vondel Park big extravaganza thing, and it's kind of it's lost its mystique in a way. I like the, the homely reunions where everyone just finds out together and goes, "Oh my god, how did that happen?" Yeah. I like how one or who was it? Cat said that she would eat a shoe if it wasn't Elizabeth. Thank God she kept both of her footwear. Yeah. All right, Elizabeth, give up one of your slippers to Cat because you won the season. You weren't the mole. So everyone is driven to De Kraut Fabrique near Brussels Airport, and they see each other for the first time since their trip. And we get three suspicions. We get Martine suspecting Elizabeth, Lisbeth suspecting Axel, and Ingrid suspecting Axel. And because Jill is a legend, he basically gets to tease Bruno and ask whether he's actually wearing black socks this time, at which point Bruno's wife obviously packs him some. <laughs> and then Martine says that it's weird seeing everyone on TV and then being there and being in the TV, which I can vouch for. This would be exactly how I would feel if I was in Martine's shoes. Be like, oh my god, I've watched you guys on TV for like six, seven weeks now. What the hell? <laughs> You're actually here. Even though he was there for the filming for the first chunk of it. Yeah. It's basically how we felt when we walked into the uh, the press room going, oh my god, we are the only people here who do not do this professionally. What the hell? Yeah. Or even being at the Survivor reunion when I went to the co Ron finale a few years ago, where it's like, and, or the Masonry's 29th finale, where it's like, huh. So I've just been watching this on TV for three months, and I know I'm going to be on screen with Jeff Probst for a few seconds. Yeah. I mean, I, I said this to, to Axel a couple of days ago, that like it felt really weird for us to be there and be definitely the only unprofessional people there. And not even be from there. 
Yeah, and I'm sure it felt really weird for those guys, so we couldn't really sympathise with them kind of walking into a room of potentially intimidating journalists. I know none of them were intimidating, but you know what I mean. It's exactly how we felt when we walked in an hour earlier going, oh my god, this is way more professional than I think we were expecting. We are so out of place here. As we have the Coke bottles on the floor of the room. Yeah, as I try and force you to look like a fat bastard and go get me a Coke before the uh, screening starts. <laughs> Jeez. There's a Burger King next door. <laughs> I know, but there was free drinks in there, right? I was going to yeah, say... Yeah, if it's free. It. Yeah. yeah. I, if, I mean... If it's not nailed down. Money saving travel tip 101 with Logan Saunders. If there's a free buffet, you take full advantage of it. I just released all those videos today, actually. Yeah, I know what you did. I haven't watched them yet, but I know what you did. So Kat and Yuri both suspect Elizabeth as well. Bruno says Bass and Axel. And Ava says Bass as well. And then they all watch the finale and laugh as you should at the massage karaoke challenge. I like how they showed at the very end of the reunion the dream teamers testing out that challenge. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I guess you really have to have dream teamers that have to <laughs> pretend they're doing the karaoke massage. Well, Axel said to us that um, they had dream teamers right in front of him, basically, when he was going through the tunnels. And they, and they also tested it before they'd even got there anyway. And the dream teamer got stuck and they ran the challenge. He did. Because Which Belgium we've... waits for no one. <laughs> yeah. And it looked like that tunnel challenge. I wonder how... It... I don't, maybe not upset's the right word, but producers are probably disappointed that so much of it didn't work out the way they wanted it to for such a cool location. Yeah, that that was the one sabotage where my jaw dropped going, oh my god, how did that not work? Yeah, like in... And that was... Was that one of my main points I brought up during the podcast this year that made me very suspicious of Elizabeth? Yeah, I think it was. Because that was the one week where she was the person I went all in on on my suspect list was the, the tunnel week. It was the only week where I put all my points onto her. Which makes sense looking back at it, where it's the one time where even she was like, uh, that a wasn't a good obvious. sabotage. Too obvious, yeah. And that's the one week where... It's the one week where everyone... even I was onto her. Yeah. If you're even onto her, then she really stuck her neck out way too far. I cannot wait for one of these seasons to come along where you're so unbelievably wrong and I get to be impossibly smug about it. Wait till next year, Michael. I've got two chances again next year. You never know, Michelle might be right again. I have to be shut out with Belgian Mall, though. That's the main one. You can't claim Peter against me when I was onto Peter as well. I'm not claiming it against you. I'm just saying going into a final three... I have expressed lots of confidence and have been right every time. Yeah, whatever. I can't wait for you to be wrong. Exactly. That's the whole fun of the game. And my favourite reaction to Elizabeth being revealed as a mole goes to Ava. She screams! Because something wonderful that's happened this year that we haven't really acknowledged on the podcast is the fact that Fear have basically opened up their website to anyone in Europe. So if you have a European IP address, you can watch Belgian Mole Without any subs, obviously. But you can watch Belgian Mole on their website now. Which, you never used to be able to do that last year. Which is great, and I'm hoping that we're kind of a, a little reason for that. But, I watched the first kind of five minutes of the um, the reunion on Sunday night, just, just out of interest, to see everyone's reaction when uh, Elizabeth was revealed as a mole. And I actually had to screen cap Ava's reaction, because I'm like, there's not going to be much of this reunion that I love more than Ava's reaction, I don't think. There is one moment that did beat it, and that's our banner this week, but I really enjoyed Ava's reaction just going, oh my god, I am so wrong. That definitely is the, I couldn't have been more wrong even if I tried face. And I thought it was really sweet that Elizabeth kept crying as well. Yeah, she was generally nervous about being revealed to everyone else. We kind of realised after watching everyone's interviews and stuff that she's really not used to lying that much. She described herself a few minutes after this bit in the episode saying she's not one to lie but she's good at it I'm like I don't think that Elizabeth really goes through life deliberately misleading people no but she's like the type of person who can do it well in a game format which as we learned she is actually really good at that oh yeah she's stunningly good at it 
probably goes with the profession too. A high pressure job like being a what is she a doctor in a hospital? Yeah, she's a emergency doctor. She is emergency room doctor. Yeah, emergent ER doctor. That's as high pressure as it gets. So I guess if there's anybody you want to pick as the mole who can do well right on the spot with no preparation, it's going to be an ER doctor. I would probably go so far as to say that she's my favorite of the four Belgian moles we've seen. Not just because she's met us and she's awesome and really kind to us and things, but she had by far the hardest job of any of these moles, and she exceeded everyone's expectations on it. She did the best. So much so that production sent her a card. Yeah. I don't remember Jill's or um, Elaine or um, or Peter getting any cards from production. No, but there also wasn't a they... motorhome part nearby. Yeah, that's true. Imagine just going outside of your house and there's a motorhome, and you go inside to get a text. Hey, Peter, look underneath the, the cushion. Oh, it's a letter from Jill's. This is his only way of communicating to people now. He's gotten really involved in his job. I really hope that they bring the motor home back next year. Just for funsies. Just to troll people a little bit. Who gets who gets to own that motor home the rest of the year? Yeah, that's what I want to know. Because is it Gilles and he's just kind of lent it out to production? Or does it stay in storage for 11 months until they need it again? My wife kicked me out. I haven't been allowed back in since. <laughs> so there were 12,000 people who applied... And they went into it knowing that they wanted people who wanted to be the mole. So that ruled out nearly half of them. Ruled out 5,528 people. Makes it easier. Yeah. 200 people got a call back for the initial interview. And then 30 people got a second call back. And every one of those 30 got the couch message where we saw the iconic moment of Ingrid's biscuit eating. And somebody who didn't get a cast said, yes, I'm going to be this sneaky bastard. You know what would be great is if in future years, they come up with other arbitrary criteria as to who they want to be the mole. So this year was a bit more obvious of just, oh, we want 10 people who want to be the mole to be cast. Okay, we can rule out half. Maybe next year it's like, oh, we don't want anybody with uh, blue eyes or eh, we don't want anybody that's below five foot two or five foot five. Let's just let's just rule all those people out. You know, things that make the casting process easier for for the production. Here's my question. Would you ever, on an application for the mole, go, I don't want to be the mole? No. Exactly. You, Speaking purely as a narcissist here, you want to be the person who gets the special thanks at the end of the reunion titles. You want to be the person who is literally the title of the show. And you want to be the centre of attention. You don't go into a show like the mole going, eh, I don't want to be the mole. You might go into it going, I want to be the mole, but I'd be rubbish at it. Basically, the Martine tactic. But you don't go into it going, nah, I don't want to be the mole. Oh, they get me fun. Oh, poor Martine. Can we just say that? <laughs> I've defended Martine a lot online this season because I feel quite a kinship with Martine. He's 22. He basically played this season, I think, exactly how I would have played it. I would have loved to be the mole. I would have loved to be shortlisted as the mole. But I would not have done well with Jill's interrogation about it. Yeah, he crumbled during that inter interrogation. I think he's a very innocent soul. And it's very sweet to see that yesterday evening him and Axel actually went to a football match together. They are still very good friends, which is heartwarming to see. I think this has got to be one of the closest reality TV casts I've seen because I can't recall a time where a winner has said, hey, what I want to do with this money is to have all of us hang out together for a weekend and we book the same floor of hotel rooms. I have never heard a winner of any reality show worldwide that I can think of that genuinely wants that from the bottom of their heart. Kathy. Did Kathy say that too? Kathy did it as well. I believe her exact quote on the reunion was that she wanted everyone to come over to her home in Greece for the weekend and she'd, um, she'd use the money to put a barbecue together basically yeah but that, i mean they still have to fly to greece for it yeah i think she would have paid for the flights as well oh I see. that was the implication yeah maybe on like pegasus airline or something yeah she would have done it on the back of a horse cart but she still would have <laughs> paid for their transport towards greece and oddly enough the winner from greece was not at the at kenneopolis <laughs> yeah 
that's kind of funny that she's the one that wants to bring everybody together. And then when everyone's together, she didn't go. And by my calculation, Greece isn't that far from Belgium, considering that's the exact flight I did to get there. <laughs> I'm interested with this podcast to see if there's any other stories that we can think of that we hadn't discussed last week, because it was a bit of a rush podcast last week, in case you didn't get it. We started recording genuinely at just before 2 a.m., and I was very sleepy on Monday. <laughs> I had to edit the uh, Diary of the Mole finale podcast on the train to um, to Schiphol Airport and also edit it in Five Guys in, uh, in Antwerp. And I was absolutely shattered by the time I got home. And I was doubly tired because I didn't get back to my hostel till four? after four. Eight, after No, it was after four. Because I recorded my video and stuff. And then I had to be up and my flight to go to Barcelona wasn't until 9 o'clock at night. And, of course, there was nowhere for me to nap. Um, and I didn't get into my Airbnb in Barcelona until after about 1.30 in the morning. Oh. So you can do the math on how much I slept in those couple uh, days. Not much. And that was after the week before where I did the whole Cape Town to Istanbul to Athens uh, debacle. Yeah, I thought I was tired then, but I think I think it's probably why I got sick, actually. <laughs> you were just run down. Cold, hungover, not, not really hungover, just exhausted, socially exhausted. <laughs> but yeah, the notable absence is, off the top of my head, Kathy, Peter, who else wasn't there? I think pretty much everyone else was there. Booba. Booba wasn't, wasn't there. Yeah. I noted that. Yeah, no Kathy from Argentina. Any of the South Africa finalists? There's Davy, Elaine, and Elise. Yeah, I think pretty much everyone else was there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's that's a crazy turnout, though. Even after for a four-season stretch to have everyone there except for, what, three, four contestants, maybe? Maybe there's somebody we overlooked that looked like somebody else. <laughs> I think it is a testament to the show how much everyone loves coming back for the finales because they don't have to they've done their their time on the show they don't they've done know, their time yeah they're not imprisoned they, they don't in theory have to come back but they all want to because they want to see each other and they they just in, enjoy each other's company just think back to like the first few seasons of survivor in the u.s granted u.s is a lot bigger country than belgium really but still i mean just by a tad. <laughs> Actually, it'd be great to relate the size of Canada to Belgium. Because what you can get from... It'd be like the equivalent of just... Like the region I live in in Canada is the Okanagan. Belgium is probably the size of the Okanagan. So I guess if everyone lived within the Okanagan, every contestant ever except for Kathy, I think, yeah, I guess in that case, everyone should be able to make it out to the finale each year without too much trouble. In fact, the mole, the mole studio where they film Café the Mole is in Brussels, where Lloyd and Baja were filming a segment with Jills, and all three of them were able to get to Kineopolis for the after party in time in Antwerp. And Brussels and Antwerp aren't exactly right next door to each other within Belgium. No, although the the place where they film the reunion, De Krautfabrik, mm -hmm. is basically halfway between Antwerp and Brussels. Yeah, it's um, it's pretty much a direct road from Antwerp, but it's quite near the airport. So Canada is three hundred and twenty-five times larger by area than Belgium. Yeah, so that pretty much would be like the size of the Okanagan. Then you could fit three hundred and twenty-five Belgians into Canada with a spare change. Yikes! So we also see everyone's application videos as always, and Bruno's was my absolute favorite because of how formal he is. Please, if you would like to do so, pick me to be the mole this year. I wait your correspondence. <laughs> and Ava <laughs> says that she wanted to uh, fuck with others as well. She's the, if Axel's the fuck boy, then she's the fuck girl. <laughs> and the final ten came back to that mysterious place in, um, in Antwerp two months before the departure date and got the good news that they were going. And this is the point where they got two mole tests. 
lying to the casting team about being scared of rabbits, which is the one we knew about, and claiming not to recognise the producers when they walk in. This is one of my favourite segments ever. It's one of my favourites as well. For one very good reason, and I think you probably are going to guess what I'm about to say. But the producer they had to recognise or not recognise is someone we met. <laughs> yeah. If, if you listen back to our interview with Axel, he's the guy you can hear in the background. And I think we described him as Belgium Adam Scott because he looks very like Adam Scott. He looks like Adam Scott in Parks and Rec when he's just kind of leaning back pretending to be casual. <laughs> so if you rewatch the episode now, you'll probably get, get what I mean. He looks a lot like Adam Scott. It's very funny. So when he appeared in the episode, I'm like, oh no, we're going to actually have to reference him in the episode now, aren't we? <laughs> yep. So why did you love this segment so much? Uh, may or may not have to do with Ingrid and her spoiling to all of production that she is the mole. <laughs> <laughs> wanting them to keep it secret. Like you can't tell the other producers that you know now. Do you remember in the first episode when we said we loved Ingrid because she is never, ever going to be the mole? But the longer she lasts, the better she's going to be. This is the Ingrid we missed out on. <laughs> the Ingrid who goes into it going, I know I'm going to be on the show, I think I'm going to be the mole, but I'm just going to tell everyone. The Ingrid who, in Kinepolis, knocks over a palm tree three times. That is why she was cast. Yeah, she's a complete dope. However, the fall of Ingrid led to the rise of Axel, who may just be my favourite contestant in this season now. I like how so many of them suspected Ingrid because they didn't believe somebody could be that bumbling and stumbling their way through life. But there are people like that. It's kind of like me. Yeah. So some were ruled out by details about the rabbits. Axel and Bass provided far too much detail about... Well, Bass googled myxomatosis by the sound of things. And some, like Ingrid and Lisbeth, gave the game away when Belgian Adam Scott walked in. Because Lisbeth was like, like, hey, I'm the mole. Hey, you. You picked, you picked me. And the remaining six were split into two groups. Three who would get the maybe screen and three who didn't. And from the Final Four episode, we do know that Yori was one of the people who didn't, leaving just five people, Elizabeth, Martine, Ava, Bruno, and Kat. And we know Elizabeth obviously did get the screen, and now we find out who else did. And Kat didn't, Bruno did, Ava didn't, and Martine did. I wonder how they made that extra ruling. Well, it was how, it was how people dealt with the first challenge, I think. I guess so, yeah. And their attitude. So why do you think that um, Ava and Kat got ruled out? I don't know. Because I was convinced after that first episode that Kat did. Obviously, because, you know, she was my suspect for six weeks or whatever it was. I wonder if they, were, they thought both would be naturally suspicious. Maybe that's one of the biggest things, if, it's, if you compare them to Elizabeth. And they're like, eh, Elizabeth may not draw as much attention as the mole and not be super suspicious. I think it's the calm under pressure bit, more than anything, that's the reason why Elizabeth got chosen. Because, yeah, she stayed completely herself between the the first challenge and then the interrogation with Jill, but she also, more importantly, stays super calm under pressure, and you need a mole like that when you're going to thrust everything onto them like they did this season. Yeah, where they know there's a huge margin for error. Like, could you imagine if Ingrid was picked to be the mole? Oh my god, it would have been the best. I just, I feel like every sabotage would, would have been botched. Yeah, it would have been super obvious, but also I, I just want to see what Ingrid would have done with some of the sabotages. Because what, three people picked her to be the mole, so I'm curious how many more would have picked her if she actually was the mole, and actively trying to be the mole. Well, it's five people in total who picked Ingrid on one of the first two tests. Out of nine. That's insane. Because Axel did it on test two, Kat did it on test two, Bruno did it on test one, Ava did it on test two, and Lisbeth did it on test one. Yeah, I would love to hear their reasoning why they thought, yeah, production would pick an Ingrid. And the reason Martine was discarded as a potential mole is because he was visibly more nervous and basically botched all of Jill's interrogation. And Bruno was much more self-confident, he didn't stay like himself. But Elizabeth did, 
and that earned her the chance to become the mole. And she looked very nervous when Jill talked to her about it. I think most people would, because production's like, hey, so filming started, and you gotta do this now. You are our number one choice. Have fun. We'll see you at 2 a.m. <laughs> Check for the phone behind the bathroom. And do you know what the, was the most egregious thing about this reunion episode? They got a barbecue and we didn't. Oh. Who you think cooked it? I'm not sure. It was It was a, a faceless uh, person, wasn't it? We never saw who, who it was. Ooh, hidden clue. If you look at the 13th, uh, 13th frame of it, you see their face. Yeah, the 13th button on his shirt. You can see the reflect. It's not a real button. It just says "It just says uh, Le Chef 2019" on it. And then we get to see all of the various sabotages and everything like that. But my favorite thing of this entire episode is Jill's beach briefing, because he had to brief Elizabeth about asking whether she wanted to be in the cabin or in the water. And I think she probably made the wrong choice there, but we'll get to that in a minute. But to everyone else, he just started doing stuff like listing companies he's argued with on social media. (laughs) Yeah, he was talking about, wasn't he talking about internet, like ISPs, internet service providers? Yeah, he listed three companies who he'd argued with. (laughs) I argued with them for two hours. Or or he like, it'd be funny if he like tells like, here are three things you didn't know about me. I'm adopted. Um... I love the the smell of a freshly a freshly mowed grass outside on a nice summer day, <laughs> and I hate chocolate ice cream. But it would just be so funny if he just talks about the most random and embarrassing things. I would have loved to find out what the rest of the the briefing was in terms of the stupid stuff that he did say. <laughs> did you know I didn't lose my virginity until I was thirty seven? <laughs> I didn't know I I, I... <laughs> I'm just thinking of other things. Um I didn't know who Alex Trebek was. I just found out last week. Or a fidget spinner? No clue what those are. And Elizabeth says that she was worried about Mikael as he doesn't listen to her at the best of times and she only had an hour to brief him. And then we find out everyone's suspicions. So Lisbeth went home when Ingrid suspecting Ingrid went home suspecting Martine. Martine went home suspecting Yuri. Why suspect Yuri? Why? Yuri was never suspicious. He was on Yuri for all three of his weeks. Same with Ingrid. Neither of us were ever on Ingrid and ever on Yuri. How in the world were those two the most suspected people in the first three weeks? No idea. And then I didn't write down who I was suspected, I can't remember. Uh, Bruno suspected Kat. Didn't Ava suspect... Or, oh no, Kat suspected Ava. And then she's like, oh, how am I still in this? Because Kat, I guess, went all in on Ava on the quiz. That early. That seems like a mistake. And then Yuri, Kat, Bass, and Axel were all onto Elizabeth from the final five. Yuri was only onto Elizabeth because Bass and Axel slipped up at the Coochie Tunnels. Yeah, Yuri's like, hmm, I guess Cat is not the mole. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Then I guess I should start suspecting Elizabeth, because that's who they suspect, and they're still in the game. And as he said to us, Axel started suspecting Elizabeth from the boat challenge, and that's because she made a tactical error. Yeah, Boss mentioned this too, right? That he... Oh no, his was during the cage challenge, and then the boat challenge was the biggest red flag for him when he was reflecting. Yeah. That's what he told us, right? Because everyone knows that Elizabeth is weak in the water, and therefore the mole would probably keep her in the water if she wasn't the mole. So that was probably her biggest tactical mistake, because I'm not sure anyone would have really suspected her without her doing that. That she could have stayed undetected all the way till Final Four? I think she would have had to do a very obvious sabotage at Final Four. Shows you how tough it is to be the mole. Just a little thing like, like, oh, Elizabeth's not in the water instead of the cabin? Okay. Well, it's kind of the theme of the season, in that they picked Elizabeth because she was exactly the same person before she found out she was the mole as when she was being interrogated as maybe being the mole. As soon as Elizabeth starts playing against type, that's when people start looking at her. And that's what happened here? Yeah. 
And Baz suspected her from episode 5, but he couldn't confirm his suspicions as he didn't do that test because he had an uh, exemption and he needed Kat's help to confirm the suspicion. Kat answered every question in test 4 with Ava and she started looking at Elizabeth in test 5. Yuri is only suspicious of Elizabeth after Baz slips off at the Coochie Tunnels. And Kat went home because she didn't know all the answers to the questions, but she did put everything on Elizabeth at that point. That was from final, so final five onwards, everyone was on Elizabeth. Yeah. Which is slightly earlier than last year, because Yoko was the last one last year who didn't suspect Peter. And she obviously went home at final five. Right. But overall, in terms of just nobody suspecting her the longest... Um, Elizabeth has the most um, success with that. It's just that, I mean, I mean, things were out of her control. I mean, boss just but boss and Axel slipping up to Yuri. Elizabeth has no control over that, or Cat putting everything on Ava and realizing, hmm, who would have had the overlap with any of those questions, and then that's how she would have been able to conclude Elizabeth. So it's just bad luck for two out of the last four people left standing in the game. And in the final test, Axel won with a score of 29 out of 30 against Baz's 27 out of 30. Which ties Davy's record of 29. It certainly does, as Davy said to us when he was not sober on Sunday, um, that he did have the record for most uh, correct answers on a final quiz, but we do find out that Axel has now equaled that record. No one can do the perfect 30. Because they ask about all the obscure details, don't they? I guess, I mean... They want to resist having a tie, right? I assume ever since Kathy and Hannah had the double tie, that they always want to make... I mean, it's like doing a test in school where there's a general grade of where you want most people to finish, and then you got to throw in those tougher and those nearly impossible obscure questions just to make sure as few as people as possible can get that 100%. Yeah, but you also have to remember that most of the questions on the final quiz will be... 50-50 if you're not the mole. Yeah. You just have to have the memory to, to know exactly what the 50 you're looking for is. Don't they usually have more than a couple options, though, on the final quiz? Not sure. Because I could see getting some wrong if it's there's like four or five possible answers. Which, I, I yeah, I think they would have to do that, wouldn't they? Otherwise, it might be too easy. I think somebody would get 30 out of 30 if there was just... Three, if you, you knew there was just three options and one of them was your own. So, yeah, 50 50 for 30 questions. I think somebody will, especially with how much studying they do for the final quiz. So, you got to be constantly reviewing. That'd be an interesting question to ask everybody, or the winners anyway. It's just how much time do they spend reviewing their notes and who was where um, each round. So, I wonder how much Boss is kicking himself for just slipping up and nearly costing himself that final three spot. Being like, huh, if I didn't get out of that exemption, Yuri probably beats me on that final four quiz because I told him who the mole was in the tunnel. Yeah, if Elizabeth had got that exemption, it would have been very close because I don't think anyone was beating Axel head-to-head on the quizzes from what we've heard. He's a very good test taker which I suppose is a is a sign of a good mole winner, is that you have to be a very good test taker. Axel appears to be a very good test taker. Yori was absolutely screwed when he was head-to-head with Axel in that final four quiz. I think Baz was pretty screwed going against Axel in the final three quiz. At least he only lost by two. At least it wasn't... Uh, especially if Baz switched to suspecting Axel and have it be like 29-0, to zero, that would be pretty embarrassing. And not content with evidently having a bit of an open bar in the uh, reunion location, Yuri also brought some homemade limoncello. <laughs> which I'm sure the Italian in you is very excited to see. I like how he was talking about how somebody wanted him to sing at a wedding. <laughs> Where did that come from? The Reagan pipes. But he didn't, he didn't even reference... Uh, he didn't even reference that the person wanted him to sing about Reagan pipes or anything. It made it sound like somebody just wanted Yuri to sing at a wedding without hearing him sing on the show. It's a side job for him. By day, he's a plug bass. By night, he's a wedding singer. <laughs> and we also learn, thanks to Gilles and Ava, uh, shockadizen, which is the Flemish verb to fuck, apparently. Oh. 
And Elizabeth says that she regretted her sabotages after the paint bomb challenge, due to everyone being really sad that someone was still going home. And the drunkenness at the dinner party challenge was deliberate. Her panic attack in the tunnels was fake, which really annoys me because I made her the banner because her reactions were hilarious that week. Now I'm regretting it because it was all fake. Even you got duped. Yeah, I got I got bamboozled. <laughs> And she ran ahead in the tunnels to try and swap the money in the bomb tubes, but she broke a camera and they couldn't refilm it, so she just went for opening the bomb and getting rid of the 1500 euros instead. That's surprising they did that they changed a sabotage, not because of contestants catching on to the mole, but just from like, oh, we can't, we can't do sabotages that don't get up onto film. Yes, yeah, it's, it's honour, that's what it is. And then we see... Everyone go back to their real lives, and we learn the most important thing, which, if you've seen his social media, you'll know already. Axel has an adorable dog. I believe he has a golden retriever, and she's very cute. Axel has it all. Yeah. Life goals. Pilot, 34,050 euros, and an adorable dog. (laughs) I don't know which order they go in. And I'm sure your ears pricked up when we saw Baz's segment, and he finally mentions his mother! You know what they should have done with Baz's segment, is they show him going into the gym, and then doing his little kickboxing routine. Then they should show Bruno going into a gym, and just having a bunch of kids attack him. Or if Bruno has grandchildren, just have um, his grandchildren all run in and swamp him. Just beat the shit out of Grandpa. (laughs) And I don't think either of us really expected to hear from uh, Baz's personal trainer, either. Yeah, well, where did that come from, too? He's like, yeah, he gets he gets all this... He can't, I only get to train with him for five minutes because of selfies. It stunk from, for me as, like, a yeah, we have a 30-second segment to fill. Let's just speak to Baz's personal trainer, I don't know. And nobody said no. Do we even learn his name? No. No, he's just literally Baz's personal trainer. So random. We don't get to see him before or after that. It's just, oh, let's let's see him be Baz's personal trainer, then be like, Baz is getting out of shape. He's gained like 20 pounds because all he does is take selfies. He wasn't even at the finale. Because of all the selfies. He tried, like, in the press room, I'm sure he was going to be in there to train Boss. But then, yeah, then the hordes of selfies happened. He should just go up to Boz. There should be like an additional reunion special. And it's just Boz's trainer getting increasingly pissed off with him. Like, you missed another session with me, man. Do you even take kickboxing anymore? I'm taking away your blue belt. You're being downgraded to a, to a white belt again. You're starting over. And now onto the clues, none of which were really that face palming until we got to the end. So the first clue is that in the trailer that everyone got the... Um, the cast names from, which kudos to them, because I would never have got them all. Elizabeth's name was hidden in Braille, referring to the bowl's blindness. Bit of a lame clue. Yeah. She was also the last one visible before the logo in episode one. Bit of a lame clue. The weakest link in the hike was number 13. The 13th shot from each elimination scene was of Elizabeth. Better clue. Although, the weakest link being the 13th one, eh... That was never actually explicitly said on the show. However, then we get the best sabotage, maybe ever. The final clue is that she sang at the end of episode one in the Ready or Not song. And I am so annoyed at this. (laughs) Because for two years we've been saying that the music was going to be a clue, and that it it wasn't going to be a Moles playlist thing, and I got Avengers into my head and all that sort of stuff last year. And I was obsessed with this song at the end of episode one. I actually seeked out the Mole playlist on Spotify to find out what the version of the song that they used was. So when they said that she sang it, I'm going, oh, for God's sake. I know, because the music's been like your white whale for the past three years. It really has. It's so irritating to me. And I was super vigilant about the music this year as well, because they always hide clues in the Mole's chosen songs list, and they didn't do that this year but I was looking at the playlist each week to try and get a clue out of it, and then they actually snuck it past me. I was rather irritated. You messed up, Michael. F you, Jill. (laughs) 
And Axel says that he's going to use his 34,050 euros to go away with everyone, including Jill, for a weekend. And Elizabeth gets a present as well. She gets the unshredded picture that she painted for them. And it was a copy that actually went through the shredder. And as predicted, the mole signature was on the picture that uh, should have gone through the shredder. And we find out what Axel's first expense is with his winnings. <laughs> when he smashes a glass like he's a Viking warlord. Yeah, or celebrating a Jewish wedding. Mazel tov. <laughs> I've got 34,000 euros. I can do whatever the hell I want. And he says in the motorhome afterwards that he finished his application on May 12th, 2018. And May 12th, 2019 was the day of the finale. Do you think next year the winner gets the motorhome? Maybe maybe it's kind of a Price is Right style thing. <laughs> There's going to be like a... You win a motorhome! Show, a showcase showdown with... Maybe it's like a consolation prize with all of the losing mole contestants. It's like, okay, there's 50 of you. None of you won the grand prize over the past five years. But if you guess the right price, you get the motorhome. But you can't go over. You can't go in you know. And as Elizabeth goes into the motorhome, production sends her a text to look under the seat cushion. She rolls her eyes because, obviously, super predictable. And there is a note under there saying, Dear Elizabeth, no mole in history has received a harder challenge. No information, no preparation, no prior knowledge. We asked you for so much and you gave us even more back. For that and for everything else, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Gilles and go. And as is traditional for the mole, she also gets a special thanks in the credits. Yep. So now, the important questions. What did you hate about this season? Why was this the worst season ever? I'm kidding. This was amazing. Yeah, I was I was genuinely struggling. <laughs> now I know. Um, I know that we're biased on this podcast because this season is obviously going to hold a very special place in our hearts given we were at the finale. Did I mention that yet? But also, I think objectively this was a great season. If we were invited to, say, the Vidim finale, I wouldn't have been anywhere near as excited. Even before we knew that we were going to this finale, we were already saying this is top quality season we found a very few faults with it other than final four with the forest exemption i'm still not a fan of regardless of the after party <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i'm not going to change my tune on that I, I think it should have been more optional for it to be in play just because it's such high stakes if you do get that exemption at final four i think for me the worst bit of the season was jill yeah he was just a complete douche oh, he was awful to us, wasn't he like, he was just yeah. so mean to us. I mean, all he did was just tell stories about yelling at internet service providers. I know. I mean, he he wasn't friendly or wonderful or very generous with his time or very generous to us generally at all. <laughs> I mean, he did not make our dreams come true by inviting us as press to the finale. Yeah. And I def definitely wasn't a star being backpacker who greatly appreciated the free sandwiches and the free open bar i think the difference for us is that even before we started speaking to Gilles at the start of last season i'd already pinned my flag to the master of Gilles being my favorite mole host because he just he knows that this show is ridiculous and he understands why people enjoy this show and why people enjoy this show worldwide not just in belgium and it, the fact that we have a host who is very much in on the joke, but also deliberately trying to be deceptive as hell to us, is really fun for for me, at least, as a viewer, never mind a podcaster about it. And I think the production team just... When we live in a world of reality TV where everybody is trimming their budget down to the bone and just coasting like the American version of Survivor... Their budget got cut down again this year by having Edge of Extinction, so they didn't need a Ponderosa for their contestants. Well, except for two of them. Um, and firing their main casting producer after 20 years and all the other budget cuts they've done with making smaller challenges. Mace Race Canada, which has <laughs> stopped traveling at all. Has a budget of $20 in a Mento. Yes. And even though they have the most viewership of any Canadian TV show in the past 10 years, um, Amazing Race, which is struggling to even film seasons anywhere in the world now, except for the Chinese version, because they just can't find the proper funding anywhere. So production really 
get scaled down for that nowadays. With Belgian mold, they're like, yeah, we couldn't film in certain countries because it was too expensive. But when they do find that great location, they go all out with it. They go all out with the cast and putting on these crazy events like at Kineopolis and elsewhere. There's just not a production team that genuinely cares about their product and doesn't tone it down at all. It's very rare for us, and we were saying this before we started recording, it's very rare for us to agree on the next sentence, but we're both genuinely sad to stop covering this season and have to hibernate them all until January now. Yeah, we're going into our mole hole. Yeah, there's no other show where I can say that I am genuinely quite sad to stop covering. And the thing is, too, is that like when you think of other shows that have done four seasons, even with Amazing Race, the first four seasons of Amazing Race, you still had one within there that was a weak link. Um, even with Survivor, you would you would say like, oh well, this one out of the four seasons wasn't that good. With Belgian Mole, there's not one that really sticks out as a sore thumb as not being as great as the others. No. And the other element of that is the fact that, as you said, the production team genuinely care about not just this show being good, but about all the contestants enjoying themselves and just trying to make a good product. Because I highly doubt, from what we know about reality TV worldwide, that their budget is huge. I'm not sure whether we're actually going to say where the original location was, but when we asked you last year, have you got a location locked in for next year, this year? He said, yes, we know, we know where we want to go. We've got it down to three. Vietnam was not their number one. And we didn't actually mention this in the finale podcast. Vietnam was not their number one. Jill told us that. And that was because of money. But they made it work. And they made a fantastic season. And I think from being around everyone involved in the show, not just production, but the contestants, as we may have mentioned, we were around a lot of the contestants last Sunday evening. Everyone is genuinely really excited to just be a small cog in this season. And I think this season, especially, there isn't a weak link in the cast. Because I could say one word, and you would know exactly who I was referring to, in, regardless of who it was in the cast. So, for example, Biscuit. Ingrid, obviously. <laughs> Victim of small children, obviously Bruno. Reagan Pipe, Yuri. <laughs> that's what I mean. These people are such fully fledged characters, and that's not something that we can get on any other show. And I feel kind of bad about bad mouthing Amazing Race, given that we've still got eight weeks of that season to go. But I think the fact that I'm not as enthusiastic about Amazing Race is partly because this season was so good, but also because we do know all those characters on Amazing Race, and I'm not as enthusiastic to hear for example, Chris and Brett talk about whatever, as I am to hear Yori talk about Regan Pipes, or that dinner party challenge on repeat, or Axel being massaged while trying to do karaoke. That's the thing that Jill's pointing out too, he's like, why would we ever do celebrities? Because the interactions you get from regular people who never touch Hollywood or any mainstream television, the reactions you get from them is super genuine and just, you couldn't, you couldn't script it. And I think it says it all that there was 10 episodes this season as well. Because that's not something we've touched upon, the fact that there was one extra episode this year. And that was partly, obviously, because of the mole hasn't been chosen twist. But also, I think the network obviously has a lot of faith in it. Because last year's finale, the Mexico finale got 61% network share. It's about 55 this year. Oh, that's still... That's still well over half of the country watching it. And I know this is something we talked about with Vidim in March, but the numbers are insane. They have higher numbers than Vidim. Yeah, they do. For what I consider, without blowing smoke, and regardless of the fact that we are friends with a lot of people in the show now, without blowing smoke, it is the best show on TV, and I've shouted it from the rooftops. I've said it on The Chase, which is the UK's most watched game show. I've said it on The Code with Ant. I've said it on the radio pretty much every time I've been on it. Anytime anyone asks me what show is your favourite to cover, without a shadow of a doubt, I always say The Mole, and the Belgian version's the best. And I'm sad to now be saying goodbye to it. 
And hey, if Vidim's really good, that's that's a that's a reasonable holdover for those last couple of crucial months. It is, and it's not something I've really gone into on the podcast, but I'm feeling really burnt out with the podcast at the moment. We scheduled this year so that it would be a little bit easier in terms of me not being very available at back end last year. We scheduled it this year so it was a little bit easier. We would have had a couple of weeks gap between pretty much every show, so Vidim would have ended, then we would have had about two weeks before Belgium all started. And then Belgium Mole would have ended and we would have had about two weeks before Amazing Race started. That didn't happen. But I was less angry about Belgium Mole being brought forward than I was about Amazing Race being brought forward. Because Belgium Mole, I would cover regardless of the timing. I would make it work. Yeah, and I think from now on that's definitely going to be the case. And I just love that we get such such great opportunities from it, but also such wonderful, just wonderful feedback. Everyone's so nice with the Mole. Yeah. So have you got anything you want to say about the rest of the season? There was one thing I had in my mind, but I've completely forgotten it. This is your last chance until January, so get on with it. can't remember. I thought it was something about the location thing. But I feel like we covered it. Yeah. I'm not 100% whether we're supposed to say where they were going to go. It's not our, our thing to reveal, I don't think. Yeah, all we can say is that the place they were thinking of going to would be a lot more expensive than Vietnam. Yeah, and we would have had some fun with that season, because I can imagine what they would have done with that location. Yeah. So, with that, the mole goes underground for another year, and so do we, at least in terms of the mole. Thank you to everyone involved in both moles this year for another fun year. From you guys for listening to Marika and Natalia our wonderful subtitlers. And if this is Natalia's last year of doing it, it's a wonderful season for us to go out on. But hopefully she will make it work. She has kind of floated the idea again of uh, not doing next season, but she's hopefully going to be convinced to uh, to do it again. And we'll make it work if, if she doesn't, but I really hope she does. Yeah, we'll just learn Flemish. Yeah, we'll just learn Flemish for this, whatever. <laughs> it's the sort of thing we would do in our seven months off or whatever it's going to be. <laughs> Yeah, they say you can be fluent in a lot of European languages within three months, so... We'll work on it. Yeah. Thank you to Gilles, Lise, and everyone at SBS for taking a chance on this little podcast and inviting us to Kinepolis. You honestly don't know how much it meant to me, personally. And it's been an experience I will never forget. And over the past ten days, I've been talking about it far too much. Everyone is getting bored of me saying, Did you know I was at the Belgian Mall finale? I bet you didn't. Thank you for listening to all our Mall recaps this year. We'll be back next year for Vista Mall Season 20. If you've got any questions, feel free to contact us on our Facebook page, Reality TV Warriors, on our Twitter account, RTV Warriors, or on Twitter pages, MJ Armstrong for me, and Log Super Quacky for Logan. Also, if you're watching Amazing Race 31, we'll be back for the next eight weeks to recap that. Thank you for listening. Until next year, touch the ends. Peace out, and just chill till the next of flavoring. Yeah. <laughs>